Listeners, I'm so excited to bring you this special bonus podcast all about MEND, the new virtual workshop I've launched with Rosie Molinari, who's author of Beautiful You. You may remember Rosie from episode 52 of Body Kindness, Radical Self-Acceptance. And that is the theme of our course, which is called MEND, and it's about healing the relationship with yourself. So here's what you're going to get in this bonus episode. The first 20 minutes, you're going to hear Rosie and I talk a little bit more about the intersections of perfectionism, shame, and radical self-acceptance, and why we have these barriers, why we felt that we needed to address them, and we offer some, some tips and advice for getting started. What I really wanted you to see out of this is the interaction Rosie and I have, because this is what you get in our videos that are part of the workshop. Rosie and I have a conversation on a specific specific topic and then we support that with specific resources and tools that will help you and there's inspirations we've got poems and meditations and just everything that we would do together in an in-person workshop we've applied to a virtual workshop so that you can save on airfare costs working it on your own schedule Um, and we're really really excited to bring that to you so if that sounds interesting to you want to let you know a couple things you can learn more and sign up it's body kindness book.com slash mend it's bodykindnessbook.com slash mend that's m-e-n-d when you're there if you think that this is going to work for you the first week of the module is march 14th and any time that week that you could start it's fine it's not too late even if it's better for you to start on the second week you will be able to um, review week one and two and really not miss a thing The bulk of the course is material that you can do on your own. If you'd like to join in our Facebook group, we do have a complimentary um, Facebook group where you can engage in conversation with folks as you're going through the material. And then on week four, we offer a live interactive Q&A time with Rosie and myself. And if you can't make that time, you can always submit a question in advance. But check out the website. And then for a special offer to you for listening, I have a coupon code I'm going to give you. Um, So that is spiral up. It's a capital S, lowercase p-i-r-a-l, capital U, lowercase p. And that's all one word. That should knock $130 off your registration, taking it down to $299 for our six-week virtual workshop. If you have trouble, the code doesn't work for you, you need my help and support, um, anytime, even through that first week of the course, just shoot me an email, rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. It's Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. I'll help you out, get you organized, make sure you get the podcast deal. Just let me know that that is what you're looking for. And I really, really hope to see you there. And I hope you enjoy this conversation with Rosie after our initial conversation where we talk about radical self-acceptance and perfectionism and how that intersects with our lives and our ability to move forward. Then you're going to get a full replay of the podcast interview I did with Rosie. That's episode 52. And you know, Rosie, in in our conversation, she really is the champion of radical self-acceptance, this belief that you're worthy enough just for being born and that the idea that you don't have anything to do to prove your worth. Um, So you'll love this conversation. You'll love what she has to say there. And if it is a good time for you, we would absolutely love to see you in our course, MEND. Hey, Rosie, it's so good to talk to you today. Hey, Rebecca, how are you, girl? I'm doing well. I have enjoyed uh, getting to spend lots of time talking with you and working with you as we're just getting ready to launch our virtual workshop, MEND. I feel like it's the best gift I've given myself this year. Ooh. Hanging out with you. (laughs) Uh, you know, and maybe we should do some uh, visits to each other as well. I was, it was just so much fun. Um, yeah, just talking about it and thinking about it. I, I, I remember when um, 
I first had you on the podcast and it's still one of the most popular, most downloaded podcasts I have. Uh, and people really loved our conversation. So I'm really excited to be able to reshare that conversation um, in this podcast. Um, but one of the things that came out uh, from listener feedback was uh, this idea that people didn't realize the ways in which um, the lack of self-acceptance was getting in their way of practicing body kindness and creating a better life. And I just think everything you do really helps to open people's eyes to seeing that they really have a lot more power than they give themselves, but they they kind of don't see it for themselves. Um, so, so yeah, I'd love to get your input and insight into what you think What is the problem? Like, why? Um, Why do we get stuck there with self-acceptance? You know, I think it's interesting. We have a culture that really promotes aspiration. And I'm certainly aspirational. But I think the way our culture has taught us to embrace aspiration is um, at the expense of believing that we're not enough as we are as opposed to embracing aspiration as, wow, this is my next opportunity. Um, and I used to believe that how life evolved is that you figured things out and then you got to park in perfect for a while, that you got to <laughs> park in this really good spot. And then, you know, I would, you know, quest, quest, quest and get to a spot that I'd been, that had been on my radar and realized like, wow, there's still challenges here and there's still hard stuff. And then I had this moment of realizing like, oh, that's actually the very point is that we always get the opportunity to grow. And so I think a lot of times we feel like growth is at the expense of who we are um, and um, a recognition of that we're not enough as opposed to just the next natural step in our journey and that all of life is journey um, and is meant to be that way, which doesn't mean that this particular moment and who we are in this particular moment is bad. It's just, oh, we have another opportunity ahead of us. And so finding a way to coexist with a desire without the desire becoming dismissive of who you are, I think is the very reason to really root yourself in self-acceptance and body kindness. Yeah, you know, I I agree. I was thinking about one of the key mistakes we make is point to ourselves as the problem, right? So I am broken. I am wrong. Um, We we mislabel our attention. Uh, You know, rarely do we challenge cultural expectations that are unfair, right? Um, Whether it's beauty or appearance or, um, you know, how a woman should behave in society. You know, there's, we rarely acknowledge that there is a cultural pressure um, that is pushing us to conform and to follow. And when we don't, acknowledge that, we're left to just compare ourselves to the standard, right? Other people, the standard of what supposedly has been labeled as good, and then reflect to ourselves, well, I am bad. I don't match this. I don't measure up. And when you are in that point where you are saying, what is wrong with me? Why can't I do this? I should be able to just do this. It becomes, like I talk in body kindness about like shooting on yourself, right? Like it becomes this self-blame that is, I mean, not just unhelpful in creating a better life, but when you're in self-blame, the idea of being able to practice compassion and saying it's okay or the idea to be able to say, you know, I accept where I am and what's happening right now, 
you just can't because you're too focused on I am the problem, me, me, me. And that path is really what is getting kind of keeping you stuck from being able to just, you know, like we talk about radical self-acceptance of this idea of just being able to say fundamentally, I am not broken and I am not a problem. I'm a person who is struggling with however many things you want to list out on that list. But the moment you are letting yourself live in shame is the moment you are not going to be able to take good care of yourself and love yourself and hold yourself with kindness and do these things that actually could help you, whether it's change a habit or talk more kindly to yourself or or live in that zone where you do feel life is better. Oh, so well said. Shame is so dis- diminishing. And when we get to that, like there's negative I am statements. That's where we are. And there are just no returns you can get from shame. And I think what's so interesting is that people deny themselves acceptance and kindness because they feel like, well, then I'm giving up. And I have found practicing self-acceptance and body kindness to be the most affirming practices of my life and the most vital and thrive like the practices that most make me have vitality Mm -hmm. and to feel a sense of thriving Mm -hmm. um and they're really just underpinned by this idea to be curious Mm -hmm. and gracious and responsive um and so you think huh that doesn't feel great what was that about um and what can I learn from this and I just feel like sort of having that be the underpinning in life becomes so expansive. Um, So we're not, so you're saying like we're not able to be curious about a situation and our space in that situation because we're too stuck and just in blaming ourselves and sitting in shame. Yeah. You know, I think curiosity takes a fair amount of grace. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think when we're sitting in shame, shame is like the very denial of grace. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like self-acceptance and body kindness are really about like acknowledging how things are impacting us and um, developing really great awareness and responsiveness to that. Um, but in a way, in a, with a lens that has no judgment, it's just sort of rooted in information mm-hmm. uh, and rooted in the expansiveness that can come from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the other tricky thing is, is perfectionism, right? So it's, we have this culture that upholds perfectionism as actually a good thing and it's, and it, and it's not. And I think that, I think that, you know, like we, uh, you and I know, the listeners might not all understand that shame and perfectionism go hand in hand, but it's this, it's this difficult situation where culture drives perfectionism, um, but it doesn't lead to anywhere helpful. And I'm just curious what you, what do you think people don't understand about perfectionism that you wish, you wish they could embrace and understand that would help them move forward? You know, I do think that people understand that it's impossible, Mm -hmm. but I think there's a, there's a, um, a little thing that happens in our head that we're like, but I'm going to get to as close to it as possible. (laughs) Like, like, so I know I can't be perfect, but boy, am I going to really try to be as close as possible to it. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and so we believe, because we believe that not aspiring for those standards makes us bad um, or makes us unworthy. And I think what we don't understand is that we are worthy and full and um, enough simply because we exist. Like our very existence is an incredible gift to ourselves and the world. And so, um, but that's, not the exchange rate that our culture operates in, right? Because if we were to believe that we were already enough, um, and if we were to believe that we didn't have to chase the image, then we wouldn't consume 
whether it's clothing or makeup or whatever, like we wouldn't do, we wouldn't go through all these machinations to try to get as close to perfect as possible, which means that somebody doesn't get their beach house in Turks and Caicos because we didn't buy enough mascara. <laughs> so I think that that's the thing that um, isn't being broadcast because it, it would hurt someone's bottom line mm-hmm. um, for for all of us to be liberated from chasing the ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so as long as um, there's money to be made, somebody's going to put out a message of, um, you, know, you know, you need these things to be perfect and you need to exhibit these behaviors to be perfect. And that's not to say that you can't enjoy fashion or beauty products. Um, if, if you're trying a self accepting and body kind kindness approach to living, it does say that you recognize that you can enjoy those things, but recognize they don't add to your worth. that they might be a really powerful way of expressing yourself. Mm -hmm. But that you had to like, if you got up in the middle of the morning, you know, in, in the middle of the late morning, late to something, and you just had to like run out the door really quickly and you didn't have time to do your hair or your makeup or put on your fanciest outfit that wherever you arrived, you could still deliver the same magnificence as if you were all polished in all places, um, if that makes sense. And so mm-hmm. I think that's the big disconnect is that we, um, that our culture brokers so much in perfection as the ideal that we don't feel like we can opt out. And the reality is that um, we are, divine and incredible exactly as we are. Mm -hmm. Um, and it should be up to us, um, how we express that in the world. Yeah. And, and I think that the key is, is that if we can open our minds and our awareness to that understanding of that, you know, I am not bad. I am not the problem. You know, um, there are things that I should reject that are unrealistic standards and expectations. But then it becomes just this giant question mark of what do I do and how do I do it? And so and that lack of knowledge of what to do next, that lack of hope, that lack of confidence actually gets in the way of creating real change because there's There's too many uncertainties and too many question marks and then you get overwhelmed. And so, you know, in 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 my work with folks one on one, that's actually what where we focus our energy on is how do we build hope and confidence that the change you're seeking is possible, Um, because without the hope and confidence the chances of taking any kind of meaningful action are just non-existent because why Why would you pursue something that you had zero optimism or very low optimism was going to lead to anything um, beneficial to you? And, and that's why I really wanted to focus on doing a workshop. I love doing live workshops, um, but – it can be difficult for people to travel, the funds to travel, the time to travel. Um, and, you know, in the, in the surveys for that I did with the Body Kindness Readers, self-acceptance and compassion was a top barrier of like, I need more help. I need more guidance. I need more tools and resources. And the second I saw that and just having read Beautiful You, which really helped me through um, – I had that sort of latent body image concerns that I didn't want to admit were still concerns because I was now the expert. And doing Your Beautiful You book for an entire year was so transformational for me. And I was like, I hope, I hope Rosie will want to do this with me. I'm so glad that you said yes. And you just contributed so much helpful content and inspiration to intersect with what what I do with body kindness, you know, I think that really what we have is something that is highly focused on those barriers of perfectionism and radical self-acceptance with those underlying tools of here's what's going to take you further. Right. You know, it shouldn't be, um, self-acceptance and body kindness shouldn't be 
rarities in our world, they shouldn't be inaccessible. And I will sometimes um, more willingly commit to read my resources to something for my child or for my friend. Or I will sometimes more willingly commit my resources to something that I can do in person. Um, and so I, I was excited about this idea of creating an opportunity that would be really affordable and accessible and hopefully take away some of those barriers of, you know, I'm likely to give this to somebody I love, but not necessarily to give this to myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and to then not make it hard to do. And so I love that we were able to create something that's accessible financially and just accessible sort of logistically that I can, you know, watch the video, um, you know, whenever I want to, I can do the exercises whenever I want to, I can participate in the group or not. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think it's really important for us to all pause and figure out what do I most need at this moment and give it to ourselves. And, um, sometimes to really make that work, we have to get this foundational stuff in place for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and the chance to get the live conversation and coaching with, with both of us at the same time. And, you know, we put it at week four out of six so that we could build this foundation, this self-reflective work, um, get, get a certain amount of really helpful progress in our own personal journeys and then, basically ask us anything, right? So they can submit questions in advance. They can bring up questions on the on the chat. Um, there'll be that recording, uh, you know, that they could listen to and watch as many times as they want. You know, that's, that's part of the offering. And so I think that high touch element is really important um, because there's always going to be something that comes up that somebody's dealing with at this particular moment in time that is a barrier that they could really use some listening and and insight on as well. I agree. I um I'm excited about introducing and building on all of our understanding that the only thing that is broken is how our culture tries to insist how we see ourselves um as opposed to you know, giving us the opportunity to really shape how we see ourselves. Exactly. Exactly. So um, just for those listening who may want to check out more information, the website is bodykindnessbook.com slash mend, M-E-N-D. We'll put that in the show notes. We do um, launch the first module the week of March 14th. Uh, So anytime during that first week, you will be on time um, with the with the course material, I would say anywhere between one to two hours um, a week of time um, to do the video and some of the reflection work. And certainly, some people find journaling really helpful and have more time, and they want to put more time into it. So you might be more at the two hour mark, and you know others might have a busier type of week, so they want to watch the video and do some reflective journaling, and that might take you 30, 45 minutes. Um, and if you are listening, we I also have a, um, a discount for you. Um, so for podcast listeners, when you go to register, uh, if you enter in the coupon code Spiral Up, it's capital S P I R A L, capital U, lowercase p. So it's Spiral Up, all one word. You'll get a discount code applied. It's $130 off, and that takes the course down um, to $299. And that's for the six-week course plus the live chat, the Facebook group, all the material and resources we have to offer. And um, we'd love to have you. Because real health is about being good to yourself. It's time for Body Kindness, the place where all bodies fit and weight is just a number. Hi, I'm Rebecca Scritchfield, author of the book Body Kindness, registered dietitian, nutritionist, and host of this podcast. My topic today is radical self-acceptance. And this topic is important to body kindness because I believe you can't become who you really want to be until you accept yourself for who you are right now. We all need a bit of peace and a truce and some calm compassion to really work with the person we are now and like a caregiver for ourselves, carve out the path in the direction of the kind of life we want. 
My special guest to discuss this today is Rosie Molinari. As a radical self-acceptance champion, Rosie uses profound questions and wholehearted connection to empower people to treat themselves well so they can connect with their talents and passions to authentically and intentionally live their purpose and help heal the world. The author of Beautiful You, A Daily Guide to Radical Self-Acceptance, and Hijas Americanas, Beauty, Body Image, and Growing Up Latina, both books by Seal Press. Rosie teaches at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, serves as a national Dove self-esteem project educator, offers workshops and retreats, and speaks on self-acceptance, body image, self-care, media literacy, the Latina experience, and intentional living around the country. Rosie also serves as a creative catalyst to companies and brands that wish to provide a synergistic, empowered, and soulful experience to their clients and employees as they serve the world through workshop and retreat facilitation and consultation. A committed activist, Rosie helps found Hammers, a nonprofit initiative to provide emergency home repair for low-income families in her community, and Circle Deleuze, a nonprofit that radically empowers young Latinas by supporting their transformation through extensive mentoring, holistic programming, and scholarship funds for further education. Welcome to the show, Rosie. To get started, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your work? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And I was struck in your introduction when you were talking about how weight is just a number and it reminded me of this line in um, Beautiful You, maybe in day two, where I talk about how weight is just a number and we are only good, you know, that there's no number that makes us good or bad. And so that just really resonated with me. So I'm supposed to tell you about myself and, and what you've been doing lately <laughs> and what I've been doing lately. Good. I'm glad you reminded me of that because that is how broken my brain is. I'm like, what was that question three <laughs> minutes ago? I am um, a writer and educator and activist and a mom. And I um, am really inspired by this idea that every single one of us is here on purpose, that we each have a unique gift that we are meant to give this world that is one part of a solution that this world desperately needs. And that our purpose has nothing to do with how our body looks. And that too often our ability to live our purpose is inhibited by our relationship with ourselves. And so I get really excited about working with individuals on creating healthy whole relationships with themselves so that they can go out and do the stuff they're meant to do in this world. Because what really drives me is this idea that surely there's so many brilliant people around us that we have the solutions that we need for this world to be whole. And it's a matter of us getting whole ourselves so that we can make that happen for the world. Um, well, I just love that. I mean, it's it reminds me of um, Evelyn Triboli, co-author of Intuitive Eating. She is one of my mentors. And early on in my transformation away from being like the number one. Well, I don't know if I was number one, but like all I did was diets and weight loss is the bottom line. I called it healthy and it was big mistake. You know, I started dieting around puberty. And even when I was in nutrition school, I mean, I love nutrition school because it was helping people with diets and lose weight and like rules. And I was like, yee -hee. <laughs> and it took a couple of, you know, gobsmack, wake up calls, aha moments, whatever you want to call them for me to finally get some courage to change, to realize what I was doing was unhelpful to me and my clients and to change. And I studied intuitive eating through supervision with supervision with Evelyn Triboli. And one day she said, you know, you can only take people as far as you have gone. And I was like, Ew. and I, that's when I realized that I still had my oh. own work to do on body image in particular, it's one of those things, you know, and I feel like no matter how all the work you do to try to inoculate yourself, we all live in a diet culture and you never know when we're going to kind of like take the bait and bite the fish yeah. hook and kind of get snagged by it again. So it's so true. You know, I think about the moment of like, aha for me. And I was a really committed um, activist from a young age. And and when I was in college, I worked with young men who were gang affiliated. And that was just my passion point. And I had this realization as I was working with them that their violent expressions were really rooted in self-hatred. And it was this profound moment of like, 
wow, like this anger is being lived out. And sort of simultaneously, I had this moment where I have pretty big curly hair and have lived in the South my whole life and for a long time tried to straighten it and then would walk outside and it would instantly like the humidity would be like, boy, boy. And, <laughs> um, but I would spend an hour a day trying to straighten it and all this money, like trying to buy the products that said they would straighten my hair. And one day I was, was straightening my hair. I was getting ready to go to this alternative school that I volunteered at and but I was, you know, sitting there in the mirror, like straightening my hair and thinking about what I was doing that day at the school and had this moment where I thought I looked at the little bin that held all my products and easily it had $150 worth of products in it. And I went to school in the 90s and I had the scholarship that paid me $150 a month for spending money. And I thought, wow, that's my entire spending money in this bucket. Like I'm not going on adventures with my friends or buying supplies that I need because I'm putting it into my hair. And then it made me think about, well, how much time do I put into my hair? And I thought, wow, I put an hour a day into my hair. And if I do that five days a week, 50 days a year, that's 250 hours. And how do I feel about the idea that I spend more than 10 total days a year on my hair? And how will I feel about that if I get to be 80 years old? And I've spent, you know, what, what would that, I can't even do the math, thousands of days of my life just on my hair. Like, does that vibe with how I want to be in the world? And it was like this big, like, cr like moment of what I want to do is hurry up and get my hair done so I can go to the school and hang out with these young men that I really enjoy and whose conversations change my life and change me. But I might be running late because I'm trying to straighten my hair that will instantly go curly when I went out, when I go outside. And it was just, and, and I'm spending all this money that I don't really have. And it was this moment of, I have bought in to what I've been told a woman should buy into in order to, I don't know, get permission from who I don't even know who I'm trying to get permission and approval from when like those guys that I show up for just care that they are seen and heard and understood. Not one of them will be able to describe my hair texture later but they will be able to describe how I made them feel. And it was a game changing moment for me where I thought I do not want to buy into my appearance being the most important part of how I show up in the world. The most important part of how I show up in the world is how my heart shows up. Mm, that's so good. It's like the real value that you offer and the real worth that you provide is outside of appearance or the shell of your body, you know, the, you know, that really has nothing to do with it. I mean, if anything, you could be grateful for the body that gets you to get to do your right. work. <laughs> and so then it becomes really different, right? So it's like, oh, you're my vehicle and I need to treat you well because you allow me to experience every good thing I've ever had. But treating you well is profoundly different from punishing you with my mind and words and actions, you know, and it's not about anything prescriptive. Yeah. So what is radical self-acceptance? Give us like a working definition of what we're talking about. So I like to think of radical self-acceptance as the inherent belief that we are worthy and enough simply because we were born. There is nothing that we have to do to prove our worth. And that in practicing radical self-acceptance, what you develop is this real sort of sense of, a new, of neutrality about yourself, that as you take in information, you always choose not to have an adversarial relationship with yourself. So let's say that I have an exchange with my little boy this morning, and maybe I am a little bit shorter with him than I want to be. As he leaves to go to school and I reflect on it, I never go to a place in my head where it's like, I'm the worst mom ever. Instead, I understand that I am not bad or ruined or imperfect and that there's nothing fundamentally wrong about me. And that moment just has information for me. And so instead, if I'm in a moment of like self-reflection and an opportunity for self-growth, I say, well, what's the information in that for me? And so I think, well, you know, I hadn't eaten before we had that exchange and I was a little bit hangry. Or I say, wow, I read an email right before um, he walked in the kitchen and it caused me concern. And my concern was displaced on him. 
or I'd gotten in a squabble with my husband and it was displaced because of that. But I, you, when you're practicing radical self-acceptance, you choose to recognize your humanity just as you recognize and respect the humanity of every other person that you interact with. And so it's really about embracing a practice of noticing in your life, but not notating or shaming in your life. Interesting. So shaming would be being judgmental, kind of right. letting, letting your inner critic thrive as opposed to finding your caregiver voice that is more compassionate. And Right. And the, the thing that I always like I tell my students is everything is just information. It is not a grade. And so even when you get a grade, so you get back a test from me and on it, you earned a D. The answer is not, I'm stupid. The answer is, what happened there that this was what I was able to, to show of my learning? Um, and so what you might find is, you know what? I had a sinus infection while I was taking that test and I just wanted to get done. Or, you know what? I don't take notes really well. I um, sort of spaced out and so my notes aren't great and that's what's up. Or, you know what? I didn't study that week because I was in a fight with my roommate or there was a concert the night before and I went to it. But everything becomes just information and not a place for judgment, just a place for you to observe and learn. Well, yeah. So it's 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 like the growth mindset stuff. It's an opportunity to learn and grow you can observe scenarios. It's an opportunity to learn and grow and kind of get curious about and then let that inform maybe your next decision. I want to talk a bit about women of color, especially Latinas, because I know that's an, where you tend to focus. And I have uh, some Latina blood, <laughs> but I present as just like white woman. And so I don't think I really deal with a lot of the cultural oppressions that come. And I wanted to devote some time to talking about this. I mean, just being in our diet culture, I mean, just happening to be female, you're going to have the expectation of thin is good, larger bodied is bad. And that was always what my struggle was comparing to friends. And, and we actually were lower income growing up. So it wasn't like that sort of we have nothing better to do because we have all this money and all these vacation homes and all this stuff. You know, it was like hitting me on the low income side. It was just yeah. co comparing and despairing. But our society says, you know, you're not good enough unless you're working on your weight and your appearance. And I know that it can be particularly difficult because it's the intersection, right, of beauty standards, thin standards and other oppressions that exist that like white people not mm -hmm. might not really notice. So what could you enlighten the listeners on on these concerns? So my first book is about Latina women's coming of age experiences in the U.S. And I wrote it a decade ago and had this really fascinating moment while I was researching it. When I wrote the book, I interviewed 100 women and I did a web-based survey with 500 women about their coming of age stories. And I'd been really interested in telling these stories because I'd grown up in South Carolina as what felt like the only Latina that I or anyone else knew. And so I had started to really think about how do Latinas who come of age in a home that has one idea of what's beautiful and feminine and appropriate for women, then go out into mainstream America and hear a whole nother litany about what's beautiful and feminine and appropriate for women, reconcile those messages to then become themselves. Um, and my upbringing hadn't really afforded me the opportunity to be able to answer that question with like, oh, well, this is what all my girlfriends did. And so I thought, well, this is the book I want to write. And so in writing the book, one of the questions, one of the things I was struck by was that at that time, there were a lot, what felt like a lot more Latina women in pop culture. And I thought, well, gosh, this must feel profoundly different. And maybe it feels incredibly empowering for these women. Whereas when I was growing up in the 90s, and I would say to someone, I'm Puerto Rican, they would say to me, you're Puerto what? Like, you need to be white or black. And so I thought, well, it must be really different. And I bet it's really empowering. And what I found in doing these interviews were that, yes, there were more Latina in pop, more Latinas in pop culture and commonly known. But what the women spoke to was this idea that there was really sort of one trophy woman from each country. 
And so if you were Puerto Rican, like, so people thought of Jennifer Lopez when you said Puerto Rico or Salma Hayek when you said Mexico. And they certainly weren't thinking of Cameron Diaz when you mentioned Cuba, and they weren't necessarily thinking of Rosario Dawson. And so what what the women said was, what has happened is we've been idealized. And I can't be an Afro Latina from Puerto Rico because people are like, well, wait, why don't you look like JLo? And they said, that's almost harder than no one having any clue. So if no one had a clue, then they would say, oh, well, I don't know what Puerto Rico is, so I'm not going to put you in a bucket. But if they have a clue, they're like, well, you don't look like Jennifer Lopez. So you're not really Puerto Rican or dismissive. And I thought that was this really interesting moment. And it reminded me of this this, um, experience I had when I was in college. I was putting in contacts and a friend of mine said, and I was pretty distinctly different looking from the other women on campus. I was short and certainly more curvy and had black curly hair. And most women were taller and thinner and blonder. And someone said to me, I was putting, as I was putting in my contacts, you would be so exotic looking if you had different color, if you just had different colored eyes. And in that moment, what I heard was I was just different enough to be dismissed and not different enough to be interesting. So I think it's interesting to be a woman of color and to, to have these different iterations of how we have to navigate the world from everything from, you know, do you deserve to be at the school? What does your culture mean I get to assume or interpret about you? Where you have access and why? People's assumptions about you. And then to have this layer of body, you know, how we're embodied on top of us. And I think that it's human nature to want to make things as easy as possible. And we do that by creating boxes of understanding. And so what I want to be able to say about a person is, oh, if you're Puerto Rican, that means this about you. Oh, if you are gay, that means this about you. Oh, if you are lower income or you live in that neighborhood, it means this about you. And and we've done that out of just sheer effort to make things easier. And the irony is those boxes make things so much more profoundly hard. They make it hard for the person that we're placing in the box and they make it hard for us because it makes it harder for us to bridge the distance between us. And so I think that the profound thing to understand is how limiting these boxes are are how we should begin our interactions with people with a deep desire to understand and to have them lead the way in how we interpret their stories and how we understand their stories. You know, what's interesting is I encourage my students of color as much as they can, if they find a place where they can offer this, to try to navigate if they're healed enough in a spot and okay enough in a spot to how to navigate helping those they're interacting with have better language. And so by that, I mean that I am often asked, what are you? And I am asked, what are you at really bizarre places? Like I was once ordering a sandwich at McAllister's Mm -hmm. and the guy who was doing my order said, what are you? (laughs) Uh, Trying to decide my side. Um, And I know that he did not intend to be offensive. He was just deeply curious. And so one way that I will sometimes handle those sort of questions that are intrusive and inappropriate um, is to to, to say, why do you ask? Um, And so, for example, I am the mother of a little boy from Ethiopia, and my husband is a white man with red hair. And so we are a fascinating threesome moving through the world. And we, so we get asked, especially when our child was an infant, some really inappropriate stuff, like how much did you pay for your baby? Who's his real mother? You know, those sort of things. And for a long time, it felt like we were just sort of taking the punches. And then I said to my husband, listen, you know, we are fully formed, you know, in in terms of not being in pain over this. And we could really help someone who is not yet in that place by teaching these people better language. And so like, you know, approaching these questions so that we have some better language. And so Um, often in those situations now we'll say, why do you ask? And then the person has to think through, 
well, you look like my friend Gina, who's Puerto Rican. And so I was wondering if you were Puerto Rican too. And it helps them to get to a place of understanding where they're coming from and how they might hear to someone else. But the other piece is that sometimes in that moment, I'll just teach the better question. So if a person says, how much did you pay for your baby? I'll say, oh, are you trying to understand whether or not the adoption process is is too expensive for the average person? And they're like, oh yeah, that's what I meant. And so I say that because now that I'm at a place where the questions don't wound me, and don't contribute to my own, to the pain that I'm already through, which when I was younger, I wasn't in this place. But I feel like now one of the places that I can be of service is to help people better navigate um, those questions and experiences. And so how might I better interact with a person of color if I'm just trying to understand and I don't really know the questions or right words to ask. And so that's the place where I try to, to, to meet them and, and teach them better, better words or questions or a better way, um, a more magnanimous or generous way to express my interest or one's interest. Because I think, and with a sensitivity that we're all on a spectrum of healing our pains and growing. And so not everybody can be there at any given time. But if we do get to that place where, all right, I'm in some better shape, one of the ways we can play that, pay that forward is by being sort of the teachers in that instance. But I I think that in navigating beauty and body image, we're sometimes so consumed in how we experience the world that we forget to look at. Oh, and if you add these four layers um, for a person's experience, being poor, being, you know, brown or black, like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So if I understand you correctly, it's kind of like... There are labels, there are ideals in in society that are created and that we're taught to conform to that sets up our sense of self-worth and value. And when we don't line up with the ideal, we feel excluded and our well-being can suffer. And then you talk about the idea of like this box Right. So culture can put you in the box. But then there's another layer of it, this human nature piece that, you know, I mean, we are human beings. We have to work with the human brain. So even outside of the cultural roles that is defining us and labeling us and putting us in this box, that it also makes it accessible for the human brain to say like, when I see this person who looks this way, then this is how I kind of categorize them just as kind of like the way the brain works. And then it's like our job to be aware of this. Like, so for our own personal individual well-being, it's our job to be aware of these factors and say, you know what, I can bust out of the box. I don't need to keep myself locked in here to these standards and these ideals, but I'm going to come across people who keep trying to put me back in the box or keep trying to label me. And I can choose if I'm far enough in a place of my own radical self-acceptance, of my own well-being, that I could choose to try to educate them better in, you know, based on my abilities, right? Or at least say I'm not at that place, right? At least to know, wait a minute, this is not helpful. This is not in line of who I'm trying to be and kind of find some other way, I guess, to get out of the conversation or the situation. So I stay out of the box so I don't get harmed by the labels. Yeah. Okay. I need you to go talk to me for me in the world. (laughs) Um, But one thing I'll add is this last piece. Yes, because here's the one thing I will say sort of that I've noticed in my time of navigating this for myself and doing this work is that if someone has something to say to me about my physicality and my station of life, it has nothing to do with me. It is everything to do with that person and what they are experiencing and going through with that issue. And the reality is that um, we have the right to set boundaries and we have a responsibility to teach people how to treat us. And we can quit anything that hurts us, whether it is a flip conversation in a grocery store with a stranger, a lifetime friendship, a relationship with someone of consequence, whether it's a partner or a parent, um, we can, a TV show, social media, we can quit anything that hurts us. 
And um, we have a responsibility to show ourselves that we can take care of ourselves. And so I will say that as you navigate conversations or experiences that do are, are triggering or can cause you harm, you can quit every single one of them. You can walk away from a television show or social media. You can also proverbially or directly walk away from a conversation. And so I think it's good in times where we're not sort of emotionally in the moment to think about, you know what, Thanksgiving's coming up. Aunt Bertha always says this to me and it does not feel good. And this year I'm going to have something that I say to her to set the boundary. And so I typically, I'm not very confrontational. And so my boundaries, my boundary setting is not very in your face, but it is effective. And I simply say to someone, if someone says something to me that is hurtful, I will say, that's not an appropriate conversation for us to have. And that's how I shut it down. I have had students, I'm a student years ago who shared the story of her mom would always say to her, honey, I think you'd be so much happier if you just lost 20 pounds over and over and over again. And somebody in class said, why don't you say to your mom, don't you mean you'd be happier if I lost 20 pounds, mom? And she did. And her mom never said anything to her again about her weight. Like it just stopped that day. What I have found in having a little bit softer of a boundary, you know, that's not an appropriate conversation for us to have, is that I sometimes have to reset the boundary. And here's why. A person who is in pain over something, if they're not healthy and proactive about healing their pain, there's that's still so much pain to carry and they look for unhealthy ways to pass the pain off. And the typical unhealthy way that we've learned to pass the pain off in our culture is to hand it to someone else by hurting them. And so we make these Barbie Barbie remarks in different places because for a moment, it makes us forget our own pain and makes us think that person's in so much of a worse situation than I am. And so we, it's like the transitive property of pain, except it doesn't work. And so what you do by refusing the package is, is make them at first say, well, holy cow, where did Rebecca get the courage to say that to me? And then if they're not working on their active healing and they're going to see you again in a week or two, they're like, that must have been a fluke. Surely I can hand Rebecca my pain package this time. And they try again, and then you're going to set the boundary. And what I found is if you set a softer boundary, it might take three or four times of setting it for the person to realize, oh, wow, she's really not taking that anymore. Um, if you set a hard boundary, it can often be like one time and you're done. But it's always worth standing up for yourself and sending your boundary. A, because it reduces your exposure to that experience. But B, it is so affirming to yourself. Like you realize, wow, I can take care of myself. I've got this. And if I have shut down that thing that's been haunting me for 5, 10, 15 years, like what it is limitless what I can do and that's really powerful. Yeah. And it is. It's an evolution. It's an evolution of things and you know, I'm fascinated with the symbolism of circles and spirals and when I was leading a recent retreat, I was talking to them about the symbolism of a spiral and it's like when you notice that you're yourself that you're you're in a similar place, you're in another position but you know, when you're going up the spiral, you're more open and you're experiencing that same thing, but from a different perspective. And that then helps you in your journey that helps you to move forward, you know, so it's not a judgment if you're back mm -hmm. in a similar scenario that you're actually more up the spiral, you can see it differently and that those skills will help you. And, you know, along the line of the boundaries, but I also know that, you know, in my work with clients that you also have to believe that you're, you're worthy yes. of setting the boundaries. Yes. <laughs> oh, I don't want to step on anyone's toes or oh, I don't want to hurt them or, but you know, um, and it's like, no, you've got to, in some way, something in you has to be willing to say, I need this boundary for my well-being and it's OK. And I think that's where radical self-acceptance really comes in as the practice, because it's going to help you with that. Yes, absolutely. It begins to gather the proof that your worth deserves to be honored. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about your book on radical self-acceptance, because it, it literally is 
daily practices, right? So it's like, and it could take that, right? Something that you pay attention to regularly because you're talking about changing the way you're thinking and changing the way you're talking to yourself. Mm So talk to listeners a little bit more about your book. So one of the things that I, that I realized is that so much of our pain is really the result of a lack of awareness of our own self-worth. And if you value yourself, you don't hurt yourself. Um, And we want so much to be seen and heard and understood in the world. And sometimes we don't realize that the very first person we need that from is ourselves. And so if we begin to see our own worth, the world really expands for us. And so I wrote Beautiful You as a way to give people a tool where they could collect all of the evidence of their worthiness. This isn't a book where I tell the reader to believe in yourself. And here are the 17 reasons why you should believe in yourself. This is a book where the reader compiles the proof of what's already inside of them that is so profoundly defines them and just affirms their worthiness. So what I wanted to do was to provide readers with a journey into a relationship with themselves that's not adversarial and that's life changing. And that makes them realize, wow, there's just nothing fundamentally wrong with me where I'm fundamentally right simply because I exist and then guides the person in sort of a gracious way to live as their champion and companion. Um, And so it really sort of guides the reader in humanizing him or herself on their journey. And so each day there's a short passage. It's typically under 350 words and then a short exercise you do. And sometimes the exercise is keep this in mind. Sometimes the exercise is write about this. Um, And sometimes the exercise is something that you actively do out in the world. Um, But the idea is that you can just every day put a little bit energy of energy into shifting and that those little tiny shifts add up to this profound recognition of worth and this deep self-accepting practice. There's some people who move through it very, you know, day one to day 365. There are some people who open it up and sort of say the day will will guide me in what I need. Um, And then there's some people who will go through it and say, this one's not for me and just skip that date and and move forward. And, And all of those approaches are absolutely okay. I also have moms who put it in their car. And if they have sort of a 12 to 13 year old or up um, daughter will have her grab the book when they're in the car together and read a day and they discuss it and talk about sort of doing it out in the world. And so there's some neat ways where you can do it with um, someone in your life as well. There's, there's actually a guy in the book about how to use the book in a group. And I guess Jelly and I developed a a yoga and beautiful you program, um, that folks can access on either one of our websites called wholehearted that creates sort of a tandem yoga and beautiful you experience. And so what if somebody picks up the book and starts doing it and then they hear like, I'm not doing this right, or I'm not sure if this is working or that other kind of unhelpful chatter. Like what would you say to somebody who is like, Ooh, I think this could be really helpful. And then they get it. Maybe they do a day or a few days and then And they kind of start to doubt whether or not they can really be good to themselves. They can really be kind to themselves, that they can really actually keep on practicing and then they will see a difference in in their self-worth. You know, one of the things that I I think is important to realize is that if self-criticism were as effective, then we wouldn't need to use it so much, right? Like it would take care of business the first time. And so like, it doesn't really work for anything, whether, you know, we're criticizing our parenting or our bodies, like it doesn't work. And so embracing this idea of a whole new way of being with, with ourselves is really powerful, but we have to recognize that we didn't become self-critical in a moment. We, we developed practices and habits around it and it took time. And so we're not going to stop being self-critical in a moment. And so as I think about changing relationships with with the self, one of the things that I think is important to to realize is to know that that's journey and it takes a little bit of time. And so I like to encourage people that when when that self-critical voice is in their head um, to not say, well, I failed at this self-acceptance thing. I need to quit. 
But instead to say to themselves, just a gentle reminder of, I have decided to have a different relationship with myself. I have decided to have a different relationship with myself. And so that quiets the voice in the moment. And what you'll recognize over time is that you are having a different relationship with yourself and needing to say that less. And that's true for if you are working through Beautiful You, if you are working through your wonderful book, Body Kindness, or just working in life, that paying attention, reframing our energy, and moving forward is is how we get to the other side of a more gracious way of being with ourselves. Oh, and who doesn't need more grace? Seriously, <laughs> I, 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 I need more grace all the time. In fact, I was texting with a friend yesterday, and she just offered me a kindness. And, and my final text to her was, I am so grateful for that, for that grace. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and it's great when we can give it to others, but we have to remember yeah. that we need to give it to ourselves too. Exactly. And that's what I was going to say was like, what if we always said that to ourselves? Like, I'm going to extend this grace and, I, and, and I'm going to accept it. Yeah. I loved our conversation today. I love the idea of like visualizing this box. I mean, I just love visualization. So this idea of, oop, I jumped in the box. Let me get out of the box. Right. Or if somebody else says something, oh, okay. Like, they're putting me in the box. And yeah. depending on where you're at, you deciding how to best set that boundary, which may be like you said, oh, I'm over you. I'm done with you. Bye bye conversation. It may be that you've built some skill around engaging with them in a conversation yeah. because it could be a learning opportunity for them, though not everybody's teachable. Not everybody needs to be your learning project. Right. So, so to your point, if you are noticing that something could hurt you or harm you and you and you're not sure it's going to be worth it to your well-being it that may just be a let it go kind of thing <laughs> yes perfectly expressed yeah yeah so I love that I think it gives us a lot of stuff to to work with and practicing the self-acceptance and again I'll give links to to your website and both of your books I've read them I highly recommend them is there anything else that you wanted to share with the listeners how people can find you and connect with you online no, you've covered everything. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Well, I will include those links in the show notes. And thank you so much for being on Body Kindness. Oh, thank you so much. And that's our show. Let's continue this conversation in our Facebook group. Just search Body Kindness Podcast and ask to join the group. We also love ratings and reviews. Please subscribe to the Body Kindness Podcast and give us an honest rating and review. And if you can, tell a friend. If you'd like to support the podcast for the 2018 season, please donate at gofundme.com slash bodykindness.